play Jack the Ripper in Jack's Back. And go-go dancers get mixed up in murder in Assault of the Killer Bimbos. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert. size hero Willow save a baby princess and the world as well? Can producer George Lucas make a comeback after the disastrous Howard the Duck? That's the challenge of Willow, a new sword and sorcery film directed by Ron Howard. It's one of five new pictures we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert. I'm Gene Cisco of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named Willow. And I have to say right now, by the way, I have the flu, so I'm going to just croak through the whole show and I don't care what anyone says. Okay. Our first movie is named Willow, and this is the long-awaited new feature-length sword and sorcery fantasy produced by George Lucas and directed by Ron Howard and featuring some of the same special effects that made the Star Wars movie so special. Unfortunately, Willow may have the same effects, but it doesn't have the same magic. It's an uninspired and overlong adventure movie in which a baby is dragged from one end of the known world to the other and never stops smiling, except for a little moment when it kind of looks like it's a little worried or it frowns a little bit. The baby is the target of a search by a wicked queen who fears that it may grow up to replace her. And the movie stars Warwick Davis as Willow, a little person who finds this special baby, and Val Kilmer as Mad Mardigan, a warrior who tries to convince Willow that he can help if only he could escape from his imprisonment. Let me out of here. I'll take care of the baby, I swear. Just let me out of here, please. Von Kart, let me borrow that spear just for a minute. Kit, well, at least give me some water. Virgil Cut, don't leave me alone with these two. Ugh. What do we do now, Willow? Willow and Mad Marty can eventually join forces, and then they are joined by two really little people, little sprites, or brownies, as they are called, who never seem to stop quarreling. Rex! Willie, you that stupid rat dream. The movie is basically about a very long journey and all of the problems encountered along the way. And although journeys have inspired some of the best fantasies, this one gets sort of tedious. Goodbye, Sticks. <laughs> if you really are a princess, take care of him. The climax of the film is a series of big battle scenes and complicated stunts like this one, which looks vaguely inspired by a James Bond movie. There were a lot of things in Willow that I did enjoy, including the village of the little people which sends Willow out on his quest, and also the battle in a gigantic fortress, a fortress defended by a fire-breathing dragon. But essentially, this movie is a case of too much effort and too little story. At first, that little baby is kind of cute, but after a while, I got sort of tired of the obligatory reaction shot of the baby's face every time something happened. Baby is scared, it frowns. Baby is happy, it smiles for more than two hours. Instead of three men and a baby, you could have called this movie a warrior, a dwarf, two brownies, and a baby. But the baby is basically just dragged along as a trophy, and the movie misses a bet, which would have been to play up the everyday troubles that those characters have caring for the child. Instead, the kid is simply made unbreakable and waterproof, and the character slog along through an endless landscape. Well, I think what the problem with this film is, is that it's really uh, George Lucas's old bag of tricks from all the other pictures. Uh -huh. Let's start with this character, Mad Mardigan, Val Kilmer, the little, little big warrior. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Han Solo. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have the baby. That might as well be something from uh, Spielberg's E.T., the, 
the, the, you know, the, the purity coming in to save the world. Mm -hmm. Then you have the little elves, the little tiny mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Those might as well be uh, the creatures from uh, the last Star Wars pictures. What were they called? The Ewoks. That's right. I mean, That's right. You, when you watch this film, you're seeing there's no clear vision. There's no, there's no breaking of any new ground. I wasn't surprised by anything in the film. I and wasn't I either. found it tedious. And, I, and I'm actually finding the whole genre a little bit tedious because if George Lucas and Ron Howard, Ron Howard made Cocoon, if they can't come up with anything fresh in this genre, I think it's wiped out. You know, you mentioned those tiny little uh, people called yeah. Uh, brownies. Yeah. Uh, there are two of them, and they're always fighting, and they're always hitting each other over the so, head and saying, I told you so, I told you so. So that's R2-D2? And it's, yeah, that's right, except that it's not R2. done as well. Right. You, you never really quite see them. They're not well realized. They're not dramatized. Their characters never evolve. Yeah. They're just always kind of in the edge of the frame somewhere. I think they feel if they could have just packed this thing with all sorts of things that something might work. There was no clear yeah, vision. Yeah, well, it was a disappointment. You bet. Our next film is called Jack's Back, and it's quite a thriller, quite clever, well acted, and played with a surprising amount of credibility in what could have been an easily outlandish story about a copycat killer who has modeled his attacks on women after England's notorious Jack the Ripper. Now, in this movie, Jack's Back, the fine young actor James Spader makes his starring debut in a dual role as twins. When we first meet him, we meet him as John, a smart, attractive worker in a clinic, He's dodging a come on from co-worker Cynthia Gibb. Why don't you take me out? Me? We could go to dinner. I'm too wild for you, Chris. But Johnny dies soon thereafter, and Cynthia Gibb meets his twin brother, Rick, who is quite nervous about being suspected of murdering his own brother. Saw it last night in a nightmare. Somebody strangled him. And then they hung him. The police aren't so sure of his innocence, and Rick is placed under hypnosis to see if he is telling the truth. And do you mind? You see only the light. You hear only my voice. There are so many twists and turns in this story that Jack's back is like a fine roller coaster. And I must confess, I did not. I did not correctly guess the ending. I was angry at myself, but I liked the movie for it. Credit for that must go to writer-director Rowdy Harrington making his first feature film a most impressive debut, as are James Spader and Cynthia Gibb and James Spader in the lead roles. In a dual role. I like this movie, too. I was really surprised by it because, first of all, the title, Jack's Back, you know, which is a uh, hundred years later, somebody right. is copying uh, Jack the Ripper. That right. sounds to me like a movie that could easily be missed, an exploitation film, but it right. isn't, not for oh, a moment. No. And James Spader is really the key. And we've seen him in a couple of movies movies now, right. including Less Than Zero. Right. I think this is a good young actor. And there's mm -hmm. a scene right at the beginning of the movie where he goes into this clinic where he works and he's trying to comfort an old lady who has cut her hand. Right. And the way he handles that scene, which is not really important to the movie in a way, uh, just indicates what a good actor he is, how he's able to get inside a scene and really play a convincing. He does that all through the film. What he does in that character, the Johnny character, the first character that we meet, is he plays a very soft, relaxed, normal, average, bright guy. That's very hard to do. It's very rarely done. It isn't written and it isn't played that well. Then he doesn't go over the top when he mm -hmm. has to play the more nervous character. Mm -hmm. He plays that as a guy who's sort of imploding and controlled, mm -hmm. and that's done very well, lend lending credibility to what could be, as you said, an exploitation. They're kind of a surprisingly good movie. When we come back, Assault of the Killer Bimbos, about two go-go dancers and a waitress who escaped to Mexico and fixed their makeup. Oh, no, a bimbo with a gun. Our next movie is named Assault of the Killer Bimbos, and this is one of those movies where the title, I think, really does basically tell the story. This is a low-budget but cheerful exploitation film about two go-go dancers. And I say go-go advisedly because they're not strippers. No. They're go-go dancers who are framed for the murder of their boss and escape to Mexico along with a waitress they kidnap, but who has such a good time, she decides to come along with them for the ride. Here's a scene from early in the movie where the escaped bimbos are having lunch in a redneck restaurant when some surfers walk in. Three cliches right there. This is a fair example of the dialogue in the film, which hey. is sort of a mixture of camp and just plain bad. Galbanga. Ain't no beach around here, girls. That's funny. I like that. I'm going to tell my buddies that way. Here's the scene where they kidnap the waitress to escape from the local sheriff. And 
end, here is the most philosophical scene in the movie, a discussion of the theory and practice of go-go dancing. What kind of dancers y'all say you were again? Go-go dancers, out of L.A. Go-go dancers? Ain't that just a wee bit passe? Darlene, the go-go happens to be a highly respected classical art form. It is interpretive dance in a rock and roll format. In bikinis. Assault of the Killer Bimbos isn't a bad movie so much as a totally unnecessary movie. It exists as the latest in a long and fairly honorable tradition of the extremely low-budget road picture that uses a flashy title and the promise of sub-sex, but usually not the sex itself, in order to give employment to people on the very fringes of the motion picture industry. The very fringes. Outer fringes. Outer fringes. The thing you have to remember is that it's possible to make good movies, though, as well as bad ones for very little money. And that is something that at least one of these actors should have known because one of the surfers is played by Nick Cassavetes, son of John Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins, who have spent their careers making movies that cost about as much as this one did, but are very original and very good. All that Assault of the Killer Bimbos really accomplishes is to fight a little unemployment. Yeah, well, what they came up with was a title and they stopped right yeah. there. I mean, and uh, I think that we can just say a, sort of a public service, don't, and it's kids from high school, college, who would think on a lark, let's go to this yeah. thing, it'll be really so bad that it'll be good, because mm -hmm. that's the theory of great trash. Well, this is bad trash. It's not so bad that it's good. It's just boring. I've always uh, kind of kept a little collection of titles, like Assault of the Killer, Bimbo, Spa uh, Space Sluts and the Slammer, right. uh, Blood Sucking Muckies of Forest Lawn, that was a favorite of mine. And the thing about these titles is, is that basically if you come up with a title, right. you know, they're cynical enough to figure it doesn't matter what you throw on the screen because somebody will come out for it. It's amazing what Roger knows. He'll be reciting other titles at, uh, <laughs> where will you be? At Soldier Field in Chicago yes, next weekend. Right, yes. You can expect a large crowd to hear your recitation. Coming up next, a most unusual film with sights of the forgotten people of this world, accompanied by the music of a great modern composer, Philip Glass. It's called Pawakatsi. Pawakatsi, a Hopi Indian term that refers in part to the spirit that lives at the expense of others. And what we see here are a wide range of images of the forgotten people of the impoverished third world countries who seem to be the victims of that spirit that lives at the expense of others. By implication, that spirit is the rest of us in the industrialized nations. With the music of composer Philip Glass, we first meet people struggling with bags of mud to move up a mountainside. Later, elsewhere, we witness a community struggling for the basic necessities of life. And in this city location, the visuals here are more powerful than the music. This sequence is the one that works. That shot of the building is powerful, and there are some strong visuals in this film, but altogether, I don't think it works. Pawakatsi is a second film in a planned trilogy by filmmaker Godfrey Reggio, whose previous work, also with composer Philip Glass, was a surprise cult hit, Kayana Scotsi. That was a terrific film, and Roger and I both love that. It was about life out of balance between nature and mankind, how we were all living in speed up and living in a crazy way and it destroyed the earth. That film was very clear about what it was about. Pawakatsi just isn't in the same league. It seems to lack the cohesiveness of Reggio's first film, and the music of Philip Glass here isn't in the same league either as with the first film. I like Kayana Scotsi so much that there probably would be nothing that would stop me from seeing Pawakatsi, not even my own negative review. I would want to see this second film. But I must tell you, this new film just doesn't have it, save for a couple of 
individually stunning visuals. You know, something that's bothered me about both of these movies, and that is exactly what is he arguing here? Now, you could say that the industrial nations have stolen from the third world, so they have to live in poverty, but most of his images show the third world functioning, unspoiled and functioning in the way that it's uh, functioned for thousands of years. So what is his remedy? That we should live like that or that they should become industrialized? Mm -hmm. He never answers that. In the first film, he seems to indicate that man is despoiling the universe or despoiling the earth. That he does. And the problem there is that the answer to that would be no men. You know, but thanks a lot. In other words, if there weren't any human beings, then we'd be okay because in his, in his nature shots, he doesn't even show the Hopi Indians. He just shows nature all by itself. Unfortunately, we're stuck with the fact that there are human beings. We are alive. We do live here. We tend to uh, build cities and we tend to have smokestacks and we tend to pollute the well, air. Think... And it's bad, but what's the answer? Basically, this movie is just a new age music video. Well, this movie, I will agree with you, I, I don't think has much merit to it at, at all. I don't think it makes any cogent argument. No. I think, I think the first film, I want to stick up for that. I think the first film is saying that we have a way of treating the land. Mm -hmm. And I guess this, if the filmmaker were sitting between us, he would say, first he'd punch you out, and then he'd mm -hmm. say, uh, that we have a way of treating other human beings, that there are levels that we can uh, work at. But, yeah, but it I isn't think communicated, but it isn't, but that's intellectual. Yeah, that's what's, what, on the screen, what's on the screen doesn't work. That's what I'm saying. You're bringing the message to the movie. Well, the movie itself is simply music and images, and you can look at it on that level and enjoy it, as I did. Mm -hmm. But although not enough to recommend it, because I kept being frustrated by the fact that the director obviously thought he had a message uh, which was not all that evident and which perhaps was even contradictory. When we come back, Martin Sheen stars in Da as the son returns to Ireland and the ghost of his dead father. Martin Sheen as an American playwright who summoned home to Ireland for the funeral of the man who adopted him and whose approval he's been seeking all of his life. The movie takes place during the few days just before and after the funeral as the father, nicknamed Don, played in a wonderful performance by Barnard Hughes, appears as a spirit for a series of conversations and encounters in which the son attempts to come to grips with his own childhood. Here's a moment from early in that process. Please leave me alone. You're dead. You're in Dean's Grange in a box six feet under with her. I carried you. It's over. You're gone. So get out of my head. Oh, big God, the son, you're getting as gray as a badger. A lot of resentment has been growing up within the son over the years, but when he tries to tell Da how he feels, Da doesn't seem quite able to hear him or to understand him. God, I wish I was a fly in your head the way you had a wasp inside of mine. The movie plays a lot of tricks with time and memory, as in this scene where the son is confronted with himself as a young man. Something up. You're a bit of a disappointment. I mean, I thought I'd do better for myself. Really? What had you in mind? But you can't deny that you're a bit ordinary. And then there's compassion, too, as Sheen realizes now for the first time that behind his image of infallibility, Gosh. his father was actually an old and vulnerable man. I do often see your young one in the town. What young one? Her, her. Mag, Maggie. Clear to God, Mr. Doyle, I've never seen such shiny black hair on a girl. He's like one of the young ones out of the storybooks. And, and the way it is, I'm above a Jacobs these last six years, since I was 14. I've got a pound a week and the promise of one of the new dwellings in the square. And I'd, I'd think well of marrying her, so I would. No, Da, I'm not you even can, You can ask anyone in the town about it, Mr. Doyle. Da is probably one of those stories that works better on the stage than on the screen, if only because it's basically about language and about memory rather than about images. Most of the film takes place within a very small variety of situations in which the son tries to tell how he feels and the father doesn't seem to understand. But eventually, despite the fact that it's basically just a film play, Da does begin to build up power, if only because we can probably all identify with aspects of this story about a child who wishes that he had said what he needed to say before it was too late. And the performances by Martin Sheen and Barnard Hughes make them seem very familiar with one another. They have a wonderful chemistry together, and we can believe that this really is a father and a son, not just a couple of actors. I give a thumbs up. That's what got me, too. I mean, I, I don't put this in the same league as I never sang for my father with Gene Hackman and Melvin Douglas. I think on this subject, that's the best film that I've seen. Yes. But 
I did believe these two as father and son. And I want to give credit to Martin Sheen. Bernard Hughes got raves when he played this film on the stage. Martin Sheen, I did not think, could pull this off. And he just impresses me once again with how wonderful an actor he is. Because he's really the center of the piece. It's called Da, but the father is crusty in the way you would expect him to be and it's the son who's got to go through most of the revelations not the father the son is the key to the story and sheen works so very well i was not surprised that martin sheen was so good because martin sheen as an actor has done some very interesting things over the years he has kind of a tendency to choose interesting projects offbeat projects right. about every other if you look at his career every other movie he's made uh -huh. has been sort of uh, off the wall in one way or another he seems yeah. to be daring in that way i, mean, I was just surprised and he was in this here thing. again he's uh, he's very good it's it's a very effective film. Okay, now let's recap the movies that we reviewed on the show. Two negative votes to downturn thumbs for Willow, the George Lucas, Ron Howard, sword and sorcery extravaganza that was surprisingly devoid of entertainment value. Much better, and consequently two thumbs up, is Jack's Back, a very tricky thriller with James Spader in a juicy dual role. Two thumbs down, however, for the unfunny, unsexy assault of the killer bimbos. Don't let that title rope you in. Two thumbs down for Pawakatsi, the music video of Third World Pain. And finally, two thumbs up for Da, with Barnard Hughes and Martin Sheen exploring the age-old problems of a strong father and a strong son. So Da and Jack's back, and in both cases, uh, primarily because of very, very good performance. And I would say of the two, Jack's back's the better film. Did you guess the ending? I did not. No, as a matter of fact, I didn't even know that it was a twin. I thought he wasn't really dead for a while, so that's how much I figured out. <laughs> that's it for this week. Next week on Siskel Niebert, we review the movie career of Barbara Streisand and take a special look at her latest movie, Nuts, which is going to be released on videotapes and discs in June. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Raisinets and Goopers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Get all the natural action of fiber you need for healthy regularity. Concentrated in easy-to-swallow FiberCon laxative tablets. FiberCon. Shout. Now improve with 25% more cleaning power. Want a tough stain out? Shout it out. Tap and Shore Crook Space Saver Microwave is perfect for kitchens where space is at a premium. Tap and Touch Solid State Controls, Automatic Temperature Probe, and Wood Grain Decor. Furnished by Tap.